take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading, if you will. Joshua chapter 17. Joshua chapter 17, please. We are going to read verses 12 through 18 of Joshua chapter 17. Verses 12 through 18, reading the verses responsively, beginning together on 12. Then I'll read 13, we'll alternate till we end together on verse 18 of Joshua chapter 17. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing please to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 12 of Joshua 17. Ready? Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Yet it came to pass, when the children of Israel were waxen strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto? And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself. There in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. And the children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Bashan and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people, and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only. But the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down. And the outgoings of it shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer now this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your word, that we hold copies of it in our hand tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word again this evening. Spirit of God, uh, move amongst your people, and uh, you who indwell us, speak to us, and open our understanding of your word tonight. Thank you already for the good music and the message and song we've heard. I pray you'll bless the special now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art 
come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Father, we bow before you in prayer now as we come to the preaching of your word. Thank you, Lord, for how great thou art. You're an unbelievable, awesome, incredible God. And Lord, I pray that this evening now you would open our eyes that we could build wondrous things out of your law tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'd help each of us to listen carefully and we might hear the still small voice of the Spirit of God as he speaks to us. Help us to glean the truth here that you have for us uh, from this Old Testament illustration of the children of Israel possessing the promised land. And Lord, I pray that as they settled for less than total victory, that we would not be willing to settle for that in our Christian life, but that we all would desire total and complete victory as you desired for them as they possessed the promised land. Lord, speak to our hearts through your word this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. All Scripture is inspired by God. Now, and by, by the way, it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So all the Bible is profitable. Not all the Bible is written to us, but all the Bible is written for us. Uh, there, and, and we can glean truths and help from every section of the Bible. For instance, here, where we're reading about the children of Israel occupying the promised land, actually the places that, that the... Uh, and by the way, when, when we say the children of Israel, it's the people of Israel. You know, one time a little kid asked their parents, man, they keep talking about the children of Israel. Didn't the grown-ups ever do anything? And uh, it's not just the children, okay, but uh, the people of Israel. And, and, you know, where they were, the three places they were, uh, picture for us the Christian life. They began in Egypt. And Egypt is always a picture of the world. Uh, in, in Egypt, they were slaves. In Egypt, they were in bondage. It pictures uh, you and me when we were lost. What were you when you were lost? You were a slave. A slave to what? A slave to sin. A slave to bondage. and A slave to habits. And a slave to addictions. And, and by the way, it wasn't a happy place to be. They began to cry out to God because of their bondage. And finally came to the end and, and they cried out to God for deliverance and through the plagues and eventually they got freed from Egypt. They got freed from the world by the blood of the Lamb. The blood applied to the doorpost. The blood of that spotless Lamb without blemish, without spot. How do you and I get free from the world? How do we get free from being a slave to sin? It's by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lord Jesus. And that's the only way we get free. And so, once they're free and they leave Egypt, they begin to go through the wilderness. And they started out seeing some amazing things in the wilderness. That's where they saw the Red Sea parted. That's where God protected them and He led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That's where God fed them with manna every morning. And, and He fed them uh, with the quail eventually. When they got tired of manna, they got water from the rock. They, they did that as they got right up to a place called Kadesh Barnea, which is right outside the promised land. And that's where they stopped. And they sent in the spies to spy out the land. Remember the story? And, and 12 spies went in. And when the 12 came back, 10 of them said, we can't do it. They're too big. They're giants there. And, and, and they're, they're, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And two men, who were the two men? 
Joshua and Caleb said, we can take it. God promised it, let's go get them. And they didn't believe Joshua and Caleb, they believed the ten, they wouldn't go in, and God said, okay, you'll go back to the wilderness. And you know what they did for the next 40 years till everyone 20 years old and upward died? They just went in circles. They just went in circles. They just, can you imagine for 40 years doing that? Can you imagine he's going around saying, I think I've seen this before. And by the way, all you're doing, by the way, some people, that's where they are in their Christian life. They're just going in circles. Not making any progress. You don't feel like there's no, there's no excitement. There's, no, uh, there's nothing happening. You know what? All you're seeing is people die. That's all they were doing, going around in circles, waiting for everybody to die off. You know, you, you think about when God made the proclamation that all of you 20 and upward who wouldn't go in, you're going to die. Uh, I just wonder if somebody had a calendar somewhere and they're marking them off. Can't imagine if you were the last guy, you know, and they're all watching you, but uh, <laughs> you feel okay today? <laughs> you know? But same scenery, same stops. By the way, no happiness, no enjoyment, no victory, just stuck. Monotony. Okay? That, that picture's where some people live. Even Christians. So that's Egypt, that's the wilderness, but then the third place that he's leading them to that we read about in our text this evening is the promised land. And he's leading them to possess the promised land. That's where God wanted them to be. It doesn't, it's not heaven. Okay? It doesn't picture heaven. It does picture victory in your Christian life. Why? In the promised land, there were still enemies there. The, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, all the ites that is mentioned there. But that's the Christian life. There are enemies in the Christian life. In fact, three notable ones, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And, and they're pushing, they're fighting back against the Christian, and yet we don't have to succumb to the enemy. We can, just as he told Israel, you can utterly drive them out we can utterly drive out the enemy. They were to win the victory in the land, the promised land. They, they, got, they, they got to Jericho and followed God's plan and did what God said. And the great city of Jericho came down and they conquered Jericho. Later, after, after they, undercover, they, they uncovered the sin of Achan, they went ahead and defeated Ai. And they began to march their way into the land. And, 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 and victory after victory after victory. That's why... That's why the songs are victory in Jesus. That's why when we say from victory unto victory, His army shall He lead, till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. God expects us to live in victory. The amazing thing in chapter 17 is, it says the children of Manasseh, verse 12, could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. They let them stay there. They let some things that were enemies to them that God said utterly drive them out and they didn't. They just decided I'll live with it. So they didn't drive them out. And by the way, in every instance when they didn't drive them out, they're going to cause them problems later on. It's always going to be a future problem, a future issue. So I want to talk to you tonight about total victory. I want to talk to you about where you can drive out all the enemy. What is needed? What are, the, what are the ingredients you need to get total victory in your Christian life? Well, let me give you three keys to total victory. Number one is commitment. Commitment. I would ask you this question. How badly do you want victory? How badly do you want victory? General Douglas MacArthur said, In battle, there is no substitute for victory. I understand in most, uh, you know, in most sports, especially on a professional level, there's not that great of a difference in talent between two teams. Oftentimes, the difference is in who wants to win more. Who has the burning desire to win? I recall the story of Bear Bryant and, and, and he'd never get away with it in this day. 
But back in that day when he coached, he was a great coach for Alabama. And, and Bear Bryant had a freshman who he, he wanted to know, if you, do you want to win? And he said yes. And he took that fella and dunked his head into the water trough and held it under there. The guy began to struggle and left it up and he said, do you want to win? He said yes. He stuck it down again. And held him even longer and he struggled some more. And he lifted up and asked him again, do you want to win? And the fellow again said yes, but not without enough passion. And he stuck him down for the third time and really held him there to this guy. They, in fact, people were getting worried that he was maybe holding him too long. And finally he pulled him up and he's spitting and spewing and everything else. And, and he said, son, do you want to win? And he, <laughs> yes. He said, son, when you want to win as bad as you want to breathe right now, then you'll be a winner. How bad do you want victory? How bad do you want to win in the Christian life? How much do you want victory? On April 21st, in the year 1519, the Spanish explorer Hernando Cortez sailed in the harbor of Veracruz, Mexico. He brought him with him about 600 men. And yet over the next two years, his vastly outnumbered forces were able to defeat Montezuma and all the warriors of the Aztec Empire, making Cortez the conqueror of Mexico. How was that incredible feat accomplished when two prior expeditions there had failed to even establish a colony on the land? Cortez knew that from the beginning his men would face incredible odds. He knew that the road before him would be dangerous and difficult. And he knew the men would be tempted to abandon their quest and return to Spain. So here's what Cortez did. As soon as he and his men came ashore and unloaded their provisions, he ordered their entire fleet of 11 ships burned. And the men stood on shore and watched their only means of retreat burned and sink to the bottom of the sea. The only option was to go forward and conquer or die. And they went forward and conquered. What does it mean to be committed? It means this. It means you make a firm choice. It means you're not keeping your options open. It means that you're not leaving yourself a way out. It means you're going to pursue something wholeheartedly with no contingency plan. Well, I'm going to try this, but if it doesn't work, I'll go to plan B. No, commitment says, this is what I'm doing, there's no plan B. This is what I'm doing, there's nothing to fall back on. It means being 100% sold out to a person or a cause or a goal. Not holding anything back, not holding anything in reserve, but wholeheartedly committing yourself to the goal. How committed are you to being a victorious Christian? How committed are you to reading and studying your Bible? How committed are you to having prayer time with God? How committed are you to telling others about Jesus Christ? How committed are you to be faithful to the house of God when the doors are open? Well, pastor, you know, I'm just a middle-of-the-road Christian. Well, you know what you find middle-of-the-road? dead things. You don't need to be in the middle of the road. How committed are you to building a walk with God? How committed are you to have a relationship with Him? We talked about it in our RU group that when, when men struggle, Brother Jeff's in there, when men struggle with uh, not reading their Bible and not doing anything in the curriculum and not a week goes by and they, they just haven't done anything and then they talk about how hard their week was. It's always amazing how when I leave the Bible out and I leave God out and I don't make a time with Him any kind of priority, I don't have any commitment to that, how difficult my week becomes. Listen, what's your commitment? You say, you know what? I, I, one fellow was upset he got interrupted reading his Bible. I said, you know what you do? You get up and read your Bible and study your Bible from about 4.30 in the morning till 6 o'clock in the morning. No one will bother you. 
And he said, remember, what, am I, what do you think I'm doing at 4.30? I know what you're doing, you're sleeping. But it's not, and listen, it's not getting up that early. It's what, what is it that, that is so important to you that you're going to stay up till 10.30, 11, 11.30, 12 o'clock so that you can't get up and meet with God in the morning? Your commitment to meet with God in the morning starts the night before. That's where it starts. I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to get my rest because I've got an important meeting in the morning. You see? And I'm committed to that. And my commitment says I'm going to clear the schedule. I'm going to make sure I keep that meeting. That's how important it is. How committed are you? How committed are you to knowing Jesus Christ? How committed are you to overcoming sin in your life? You know, it, it, it's interesting. God hates wishy-washy. I'm not sure if that's a word, but I guess we'll use it. God, he calls it lukewarm in the Bible. In other words, God doesn't care for fence sitters. He wants you to be on or off. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't want people to just keep weighing their options and going back and forth and vacillating. Now, when, when he says in the book of Revelation, he says, I wish you either hot or cold. He said, if you're lukewarm, he said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Literally says, you make me sick, you make me want to vomit. Now, now listen, that's, that's not how I would feel about it. I, I, want, I want everybody to be hot for God. I want everybody here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, read your Bible and witness to others and walk with God and be on fire for God. That's what I want. And if you can't be that, if you say, well, I, I, can't, I don't know if I can do that, Pastor, but I'll, I'll, I'll be in church at least two out of three times and I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I'll tithe some. I don't know if I'll witness, but I'll tithe some. You know, I'd say, well, you know what? I'll take what I can get. But God says, that makes me sick. This is, this is, this is hard to, to, for, for me. You know what God says? I'd rather just be a heathen. He said, I'd rather just be cold. I'd rather be cold or hot. Not lukewarm. God says, that makes me sick. When Jesus called his disciples, in fact, look at Luke chapter 9. Would you turn there with me? Luke chapter 9. If you, if you want to hear a nice sermon, then listen to the sermon this morning, okay? If you miss that, you can listen to that one and you'll feel good. Luke 9. Notice, verse number 23. He said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and what? Follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life, for my sake the same shall save it. What is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Drop down with me to verse 57, where it says, It came to pass as they went in the way, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Well, that's what Jesus asked, wasn't it? Follow me. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first bid them farewell which are at home in my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Of God. It sure sounds like commitment to me. It sure sounds like Jesus expected men to follow him without ever thinking back, without ever looking back. But if you look back, you're sure to go back. 
If you continue to think about what it used to be like, you'll go back to what it used to be like. When Jesus calls his disciples, he calls for an irrevocable, an absolute, a rock solid commitment. A, and I might add a lifelong commitment to follow him. But so much, so much is a commitment. When you get baptized after salvation, that's a commitment. When you join the church, that's a commitment. You make a commitment. You're driving a stake down to say, I'm one of these people. I belong to one of these people. Some of you, some of you, you, you know what? You can't believe you're one of these people. You probably used to make fun of these people. But now you are one. But you belong and you're making that commitment. It's a stake in the ground that say, I'm staying committed to the work of God. I'm staying committed to the people of God. I'm staying committed to serving God. I'm driving my stake down. I'm putting that commitment to serving God. I'm going to be a member of a church. I'm going to identify with these people. And that commitment keeps me going when I'm inclined to fall away. I've made a commitment. It's a public statement of commitment. So the first thing they needed to obtain total victory was commitment. Let me give you the second thing quickly. The second thing they need, the ingredient they need to have total victory was courage. Courage. You see, they turned back at Kadesh Barnea the first time because of what? Fear. Fear. Courage is this. A quality of mind or spirit enabling one to meet the danger or opposition with fearfulness. So you see, courage is not operating without any fear. Courage is moving on in spite of your fear. It's going ahead and doing what you know you ought to do even though you're scared to death to do it. And courage is foundational to every virtue. It's impossible to mature in Christ without courage. You cannot consistently live in obedience to Christ and have fellowship with Him and please Him if you're dominated by fear instead of courage. If you, because if you, listen, the fear of man brings a snare. It'll grab you every time. It'll hold you back. It'll capture you and you won't obey God. The way you obey God is you have to have courage. You have to have courage to do what God wants you to do, despite what anyone else would say. That's why that word courage is so important. Without courage, all of our other virtues get weak and easily compromised. Someone said courage is cerebral, but fear is emotional. Courage is fueled by information. But fear is fueled by imagination. Courage calculates the risk, but fear avoids the risk. Courage desires success while fear wants to avoid failure. Courage is concerned about progress, but fear is always concerned about protection. Now ask yourself, are you courageous or are you fearful? I like listening to Adrian Rogers. He's been in heaven for, for years. But he being dead yet speaketh. Amen. And listen to him on the radio. And he was telling about a man who was bragging that he had cut off the tail of a man eating lion with a pocket knife. And somebody finally asked him, well, if you cut his tail off, why didn't you cut his head off too? He said, oh, someone had already done that. <laughs> well, there's not a lot of courage in that, is there? Not a lot of courage there. But listen, when you, have, when you want victory in your life, you cannot be afraid. Some people are afraid of surrender. They're afraid of what's going to happen if they surrender to God. Like God's going God's to make them do something awful. Some people are fearful of their service. Well, what, what am I going to do? Or what will I do? Or He's going to ask me to do this. Or He's going to ask me to do that. Some people are fearful of their future. Some people are fearful of their past. They're afraid to do something for God because of what they've done in the past. But God, God has not given us the spirit of fear. So God didn't give us that spirit. It either comes from ourself or it comes from Satan. 
but it didn't come from God. God gives us power and love and of a sound mind. You won't be fearful and victorious. You have to have courage. You know what it took for Noah to build the ark? Courage. Abraham to go up and sacrifice Isaac? Courage. Joshua to fighting the battle to ask God for the sun to stand still? Courage. Elijah to take on the prophets of Baal and call fire down from heaven? Baal, the fire god? And Elijah takes them all on? Courage. David, the shepherd boy, to take on the giant Goliath? Courage. Daniel, at nearly 90 years of age, to go into the lion's den? Courage. You won't get victory by being fearful. You won't get victory by dwelling on the what-ifs. I want you to look at Numbers 14, would you please? Get, get Numbers 14 and, and put a finger over in Exodus 33, alright? Numbers 14. And then get Exodus 33. Where do you get courage? Do you get get courage by standing in front of the mirror and saying, Ah! Ah, I'm going to get tired. I'm going to have courage. I'm going to do this. No, it's not a pep talk. It's not working yourself up. To courage. You know where you get courage? Let's look at Numbers 14. Verse number 24. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath fully, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein, wherein to he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now keep that in mind as you look at Exodus 33. Will you please? Exodus 33 verse 7. Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone that sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out under the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. You know where you get courage? You get courage having intimacy with God. Where, Where do you get the courage to do what the Lord wants you to do? You get it from God Himself. You get it by being alone with God. The further you get away from God, the more fearful you become. The further you get away from God, the more fearful you become. In His presence, you don't have fear. Look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, please. This is the New Testament and the Apostles. They they ask them, they're standing before the council here for the healing of the lame man in chapter 3. In verse 7 of chapter 4, when they had set them in the midst, this is uh, Peter and John, they ask, by what power or by what name have ye done this? And Peter begins to preach to them. And he gets to verse 12 and he says that great statement, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You think, well, where does he get the courage to, to preach like that to these guys? And look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. How can they speak this way? How can they speak this boldly, being unlearned and ignorant men? 
what would they do? They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They knew, I know where they get the boldness. I know where they get the authority to speak like this. They get it from being with Jesus Christ. Your boldness, your courage to stand for right, your courage to obey God no matter what, your courage to be faithful, your courage to stay committed to what God wants you to be committed to comes from your time with God. That's where you get the courage. The courage that you'll follow God and not follow the crowd. Not follow what everybody else is doing. In a NCAA cross-country championship held in Riverside, California, the cross-country course they laid out, 123 of 128 runners missed a turn. One competitor, Mike Del Cavo, stayed on the 10,000 meter course and he began waving for the runners behind him to follow him. But most of them laughed at him and pointed at him. Only four others followed him. Everybody else went the wrong way. They asked Del, Vecco, or Del Cabo, they said, uh, what, 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 do you, what he thought about his mid-race decision not to follow the crowd who was all going the wrong way. He said, well, they thought it was funny that I went the right way. You ever have anybody think you're funny because you're going the right way? It's okay. You've got to row the right way. And it takes courage to do that. He ran the race correctly. That's our goal. I'm not, and listen, our goal isn't to follow the crowd. Our goal isn't to run where everybody else is running. We have a course to run. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. And I've kept the faith. Run the course that God's laid out for you. And, and rejoice over those who have the courage to follow. Don't get discouraged. And don't, don't get upset. Just ignore the laughing of the crowd who are going the other way. They're going the wrong way. Courage. It takes commitment. It takes courage. Number three, it takes change. It takes a willingness to grow. You know, we all, re we all resist change. None of us like change. It's uncomfortable. When you, when you grow, you have to be willing to move out of what's, what we've come to know as our comfort zone. We all, have, we all get comfortable with the way things are. We don't like it not to be that way. But when you grow, you have to be willing to leave your comfort zone. John Newton on his tombstone, written on John Newton's tombstone are these words, and he wrote them himself before he died. It says, born 1725, died 1807. Quote, a clerk, once an infidel and a libertine. A libertine is a, a person who is immoral, an unrestrained individual. He said, once an infidel and a libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, Pardoned and appointed to preach the faith he once long labored to destroy. That's on his tombstone. Change means you have to let go of your past. Change means you have to let go of your idea of what a perfect life's all about. What a perfect family's all about. What a perfect church is all about. Say, so why is that, Pastor? Because your idea may not be God's idea. Your concept might not be God's concept. Now you understand, for things to change in your Christian life, for things to grow, for you to, when you become new, you know what? Some old things have to die for change to come about. Before the children of Israel went into the promised land, Moses died. Joshua led them into the promised land. 
God is trying to tell them that some things are going to have to die for you to move forward. I'm talking about old ways, old habits, old speech, old routines, old patterns of life, old schedules, old thoughts, old ideas. They die. The Scripture said when we're a new creature in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, well, not that doesn't mean all things. All means... All means all. That's all all means. All things are become new. We like all when all have sinned, but we're not sure we like all when all things are new. But all things are new. Old things are passed away. What happens when someone dies? We say they passed away. You're saying old things got to die. You got to die. You got to have a funeral and bury them, bury them. Have a service. Say goodbye. Give your respects. And put them in the ground. That's uncomfortable. And sometimes, listen, change is uncomfortable. Sometimes it's painful. That's why we avoid it. Anybody here? Anybody here go to the gym? Anybody try to work out and exercise? Anybody? Three people? Come on. There you go. All right. Nobody wants to admit it, do they? Huh? You know why a lot of people don't? It hurts. Right, Emily? Huh? After that first day or two, man, people are like, they come in for their workout and they're like, everything hurt. I heard from the hair down. You know what I mean? It's, everything's sore. You know why? Change is hard. Change is difficult. Painful. But growth and development come with situations and things they're uncomfortable and painful. You ever think about a, a baby? You know, they start out crawling, and, and, but listen, they're changing. And pretty soon, they're not content to crawl, they start pulling themselves up. And pretty soon, once they pull themselves up, they start taking a few steps. What happens when they take a few steps? They fall. Sometimes, even when they go down, you go, but you know what they do? They just get right back up. You know what it is? As you go through those stages and you're learning to, to walk and then learning to run and you know what happens? You get beat up pretty good. Right now, right now, Drew's got a big egg on his forehead. Big bruise there, you know? It's, it's not too bad tonight, but it's been worse. Why? He, he's up on the little slide on the deck in the back there and he's up on the slide and uh, their dog thinks he ought to go first. The dog dives on there and Drew goes over the side. Head first down to the deck. Bonk. You know what? Growing up's tough. Changes. But you know what? Kids, kids trip. They fall into stuff. They end up getting beat up. You know, sometimes you fear to take your kid out. They think, man, what are you doing? Beating the kid up? No, but uh, he's just being a kid. It, it's, it, it's not easy. You, you get some bruises. You get some cuts and scrapes. Along the way. But you don't, you don't grow without a few knocks and bruises. And you don't do that spiritually without some knocks and bruises as well. And can I say this? You never stop growing until God calls you home. You're always growing. You're always learning. I read this quote and I put it in here. I, I, I think it's good. It says, A religion that does nothing gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing, is worth nothing. If your faith doesn't give, give anything, cost anything, suffer anything, it's not worth anything. Leslie Flynn told a story that will illustrate that. An orphan boy was living with his grandmother when their house caught fire. The grandmother tried to get upstairs to rescue the boy who would perish in the flames and the boy's cries for help were finally answered by a man who climbed an iron drain pipe and came back down with the boy hanging tightly to his neck. Several weeks later, a public hearing was held to determine who would receive custody of the child. A farmer, a teacher, 
And the town's wealthiest citizen all gave reasons why they felt they should be chosen to give the boy a home. But as each of them talked, the boy's eyes just remained focused on the floor. Then a stranger walked to the front, slowly took his hands from his pockets, revealing severe scars on them. The crowd gasped, but the boy cried out in recognition. It was the man who had saved his life. His hands were burned where he climbed the hot pipe. With a leap, the boy threw his arms around the man's neck and held on for dear life. Slowly, the courtroom emptied. The other men walking silently away, leaving the boy and his rescuer alone. The the scarred hands settled the issue. And so it is with Jesus Christ. His nail-scarred hands ought to settle the issue. I thank God the nail-scarred hands fought the battle for you and for me. I thank God the nail-scarred hands gave us the victory. Not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin in our life. That there's victory in Jesus Christ. He's won the battle. He's gained the victory. We have to live that victory out through Him. He did it fully and completely. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us so. How do you live with total victory? It takes commitment. It takes courage. And it takes change. You're willing to let God change you? You're willing to be different? You're willing to begin to think differently? You're willing to, to submit to the way God wants you to live? And continue to grow, continue to change to be like Jesus. And you'll have victory in Jesus Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Lord, thank you for these examples in Scripture. I'm thankful, Lord, that You desire that we be victorious, that we be more than conquerors. You said, Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we desire that victory just like You desired victory for the children of Israel when they possessed the promised land that they'd utterly drive out the enemy. God, forgive us when we allow the enemy to stay in our land that You said we should claim completely for You. And those enemies cause us trouble. Those enemies give us fits. Give us tonight the courage, the commitment, and the willingness to change. To experience total victory. I pray that victory in Jesus wouldn't be just a song we sing. It would be something we're experiencing every single day. God, from victory unto victory, His army shall He lead. That we would know what that's like. Speak to hearts this evening. As only you can. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'll finish praying here in just a moment. I wonder how many folks tonight would say, Pastor, if I died this evening, I know for sure that I'd go to heaven. There was a time in my life when I knew that I was a sinner and that I needed a Savior and that Jesus was the Savior I needed. And I called on Jesus and asked Him to be my Savior. And Pastor, I know that I'm saved tonight. Here's my hand as a testimony. Will you hold it up for a moment? And I, I can see that as a testimony. You may put it down. There's somebody here tonight would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure anybody can know that. My friend, I'd like to pray for you. That that God would open your heart. That you would see from the Bible how you can be certain that when you die, you'll go to heaven. If you're here tonight, would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven, but I appreciate you praying for me. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down that I would see it? I'll pray for you tonight. God bless you. I'll not embarrass you at all. I'll just, just pray for you. Is there somebody else would lift their hand and say, pray for me, Pastor? The message was to believers this evening. 
How committed are you to victory in your Christian life? Are you willing to be intimate with God and let Him build your courage so you don't operate from fear, but you operate from courage? Are you willing to change? You're willing to let God put you on the potter's wheel and fashion you into vessel as He pleases? wonder how many believers here tonight would say, Preacher, I, I want these three ingredients in my life. I do desire total victory. I want to live a victorious Christian life. That's the kind of Christian life I want. Preacher, God has spoken to my heart. Pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me tonight, Pastor. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Not a, it's a challenging message, I know. How bad do you want it? We have such a lukewarm, milk toast Christianity in these days. And it makes God sick. We need committed, courageous, conformed to the image of Christ Christians. That's what we're looking for. That's what God's looking for. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this evening. Thank you, Lord, for decisions that have been made. Lord, I pray your blessing now on this invitation that your will will be done in each and every life and heart. I pray that knees will bow and will desire complete victory in our life. That, Lord, that some of the Perizzites and Hivites and Jebusites, Hittites that we've allowed to stay in our life will ask you to allow us to utterly drive them out. And we'll possess all that you desire that we possess. And we'll enjoy all the victories you desire we enjoy as we walk with you. That we might finish our course with joy. Have your way in each and every heart, please. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand, the pianist will play. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to Him this evening. Will you please? To Jesus That's I right. surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. I surrender I give myself to Thee, fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. 
Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you for another Lord's Day here in the house of God with the people of God. Lord, thank you for speaking to our hearts through your word today. It's been good to be with the people of God and been good to meet with you today. Thank you, Lord, for those who serve and those who ministered to us today in song and uh, those who ministered at the nursing home this afternoon. Uh, thank you for a church that serves. And, Lord, I pray that you would help us enable us to be committed, courageous, and always willing to change, to be conformed to the image of your Son, that we'll let the old things that need to, to die, to die. We'll bring in all things new, and all things are of God. So, Lord, use us that way. Bless us this week now. Help us to do your will for our lives. May others see Christ in us. Remind us that you go with us from this place tonight. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.